The four-masted American schooner, the Cornelius Hargrave, was only a little over a year old, having been launched in September of 1889 as a collier coal ship. She sailed under the command of her owner, Captain John Allen, but her short career had not been without incident. On her very first voyage, she collided with a capsized vessel near Cape Henry and was forced to put into Norfolk and land some of her cargo due to the damage done. The incident was called out in a meeting of the Northern Maritime Conference held in Copenhagen as a reason for the international agreements for preventing the dangers of floating wrecks. It would be less than a year, though, before the wreck of the Cornelius Hargrave would prove a navigational hazard herself. But she was not alone. Indeed, those on board her could consider themselves the lucky ones. Hello, and welcome to the Shipwreck Archive. Thank you. Do you have the story, The Tragic Meeting of Cornelius Hargrave and Vizcaya? Here we are. Enjoy! The Cornelius Hargrave had not had a particularly successful career during her short life. The 1,400-ton ship had cost her captain $65,000 to build in Camden, Maine. But when she was leaving Camden Harbor to begin her career, she lost her anchor, which delayed her for a week. What followed was her striking the capsized vessel off the coast of Virginia. The damage resulting from the accident costing an additional $6,000. The next trip, she lost some of her ribbing in a gale and then got stuck in the mud of the Somerset Coal Docks. She began her final voyage by being blown out to sea before she could get her cargo of coal on board in Philadelphia, but she had fought her way back and taken on her load. She finally left Philadelphia on Tuesday, October 28th, bound for her home port of Fall River, Massachusetts, with her cargo of coal. On board, she had ten men in total, including Captain Allen. As she left, another ship was preparing to depart New York. The Vizcaya was a 2,458-ton iron steamer, flying the Spanish flag, owned by the Compañía Transatlantica Española. She was launched in 1872, and served a route that took her to a number of Central and South American ports. For this trip, she did not carry many passengers, mainly being loaded with mixed cargo, this was to be her first trip after having had a complete overhaul and refit. On her last voyage, she had 16 passengers on board bound for Cuba, in addition to her crew of 77, including her officers. She was sailing under the command of Captain Francisco Cunil, an officer who had sailed for the Compañía Transatlantica Española for 20 years, and had a reputation for being a careful and knowledgeable captain. In good standing with the company, he and all of the officers under him were members of the Spanish Naval Reserve. They departed from New York at one in the afternoon of Thursday, the 30th of October, 1890. There was initially some dispute about the weather conditions that night between the crews of the two ships. The first and second officers, as well as the chief engineer of the Vizcaya, initially stating that it was dark and misty, with very low visibility. But it was eventually agreed that it was a clear night with no adverse weather conditions other than the seasonable cold. The ship was under the command of the third mate, Francisco Morillas. Any members of the crew who were not on watch were resting, after all of the work that went into the ship departing the harbor. Captain Cunel was in the smoking lounge speaking with passengers. The first and second officers, as well as the chief engineer, were all in their staterooms, having just eaten dinner. Most of the passengers were also at dinner, or had just finished eating. The first sign that any of them had that something had gone wrong was when the warning bell to back the ship was sounded. 
All of them rushed to the deck. Captain Cunell reached the deck first and joined the third officer on the bridge. The other officers only reached the deck as the ship was already reversing. The Cornelius Hargrave rounded the Delaware Capes on the morning of the 30th of October and enjoyed a full day of traveling with favorable wind and calm weather. Around seven at night, with the deck under the command of Second Mate Walker, Captain Allen was reading in the cabin, and First Mate Pairing was lying down when Second Mate Walker called out that there was a steamer showing a green light on their port bow. He had already been aware of the ship. According to his story, he had seen the steamer when it was five miles away, and, as the Cornelius Hargrave was traveling around eight knots, the two ships would meet soon. There was still plenty of time to change course, though, and so Walker flashed a light to let the steamer know that there was a sailing ship nearby. The steamer did not show any signs of changing course, though, and Walker became alarmed and alerted the captain and first mate of the situation. When the other two officers joined Walker on deck, they were alarmed to find that the light of the steamer was now only an eighth of a mile away. While Walker said that they had their lanterns lit, the officers of the Vizcaya would later say that the schooner had been showing no lights at all. Walker and Pairing here disagree on what Captain Allen ordered and said. First Mate Pairing said that Captain Allen ordered a flare be lit at the bow, and that Captain Allen blew the ship's whistle in an attempt to alert the other ship of their presence that way. Walker says that Captain Allen was far more casual about the matter than Pairing describes him as, and that he said, We can clear her, I guess. As the two ships drew closer, Walker says that he eventually grew very alarmed and said, We will strike them, Captain. At which point, Captain Allen shouted that they would and ordered hard a port. Walker also says that the steamer was carrying a lot of sail, something that the crew of the Vizcaya disputed. This was an important point, since if the Vizcaya was carrying a lot of sail, it would have obstructed the view of the third mate, whose watch it was, and he would have not been able to see the approaching schooner. Meanwhile, Pering says that the steamer put her helm hard to starboard suddenly when they did finally notice the schooner to cross their bow, even though it would have made logical sense if they had turned to port instead, and that, on the Cornelius Hargrave, they had desperately tried to watch this motion and also turned their helm to starboard. The prow of the Cornelius Hargrave crashed into the Vizcaya, about a third of a way from the bow. Though the ships were about a thousand tons different in tonnage, their dimensions were not dramatically different. The Vizcaya was 287 feet long and had a beam of 38 feet. The Cornelius Hargrave was 211.4 feet in length and 45 feet in beam. The people on the Vizcaya reported that the double-decked schooner, with all of her sails set, seemed much larger than them. The Cornelius Hargrave also had a load of 2,000 tons of coal behind her. She smashed deep into the side of the Vizcaya. Walker would later say that he had seen the bowsprit of the Cornelius Hargrave carry away Captain Cunnell. However, Pering would also say that he had been standing near Walker at the time, and there was no way that the second mate saw such a thing, since it was dark, and they could not even see how badly damaged the steamer was. Indeed, Pering's first response to the collision was to shout up to the people he could not see above him on the deck of the steamer, asking what the name of the steamer was. He was certain that the accident was their fault, and he did not want them to get away without him knowing who to assign the blame to. The Cornelius Hargrave separated from the Vizcaya. On the Vizcaya, the order reached the engine room to reverse far too late, and the schooner stood alongside the steamer. It was only as people from the steamer deck began to spill down onto the deck of the schooner that they realized that the Vizcaya was fatally wounded. Pering later estimated that 30 or 40 members of the crew of the Vizcaya were soon standing on their decks, which caused the crew of the Cornelius Hargrave alarm 
since they only had boats for their own crew of ten, and were worried that those would be taken from them. They had reason for concern. The schooner was beginning to settle at the bow, and was clearly also sinking. Pairing told Walker to stand by their ship's boats and keep the crew of the Vizcaya away from them, and in the chaos, that was the last he would see of Walker until they were back on land. Whether or not Walker actually saw Captain Cunnell get carried away by their bowsprit, Captain Cunnell and Third Officer Morales were immediately swept from the deck by the force of the collision. The bridge, where both of them had been standing, was in the main line of impact from the bow of the Cornelius Hargrave. Neither man was rescued, and with them they took the only knowledge as to what was happening on the bridge up until the point of impact leaving many questions unanswered. Dr. Rico, the Vizcaya's surgeon, was in the saloon speaking with one of the passengers, Mrs. Calvo, whose husband was one of the wealthiest people in Cuba at the time due to his involvement in the sugar trade. She was traveling with her husband and young son. When the collision occurred, the whole steamer rolled onto her side, throwing the saloon and the people who were in it in complete disarray. Mrs. Calvo's first thought was for her son, and she begged Dr. Rico to find him. Dr. Rico did his best. He imagined the child would be on deck and went to look for him, only to find chaos. The bridge, deck house, and fore rigging were all ripped away, and on deck, the gaping hole in the ship could be easily seen. Dr. Rico could also see the extent of the damage to the Cornelius Hargrave, with her bowsprit and fore rigging gone, and the bow of the wooden ship entirely stove in. The deck of the Vizcaya was a mess of people running around, panicking, but he could see the same happening on the deck of the Cornelius Hargrave. The Vizcaya sank too fast for anyone to do much. There was no chance to launch the lifeboats. Instead, Dr. Rico and some of the crew scrambled up the port fore-rigging as the water rose and covered the deck. It was as if it was chasing them to go higher, and just as they were almost as far as they could possibly go, the ship settled on the bottom in forty feet of water. He was joined in the rigging by the ship's second officer, Gabriel Costas. Costas had been knocked down when the rigging and bridge had been ripped from the ship, and was covered in debris. He had a badly cut head and neck, but he managed to pull himself from the debris, though by the time he did so, the water was already starting to cover the deck. He too began to climb the rigging for the safety that it offered. Francisco Sira, the first engineer, also climbed the rigging with them. He tried to save a child that was handed to him as well, but in the chaos they were separated. None of the passengers managed to find safety on the rapidly sinking boat, and all were lost. This included Juan Pedro, who was a partner in the firm that owned the Vizcaya, and a partial owner of the ship, though he had been traveling as a passenger. He, like Mr. Calvo, had made his money in Cuba as part of the sugar industry. His nephew, who was interviewed in New York when the news of the Vizcaya arrived, said that it was impossible that his uncle would have made any effort to save himself if there were women and children in need of help. The men clinging in the rigging could see people floating in the water below them, clinging to pieces of the wreckage. But the water was bitterly cold, and they were not able to last long. Slowly they dropped away. The men in the rigging also suffered from the cold. At first, they burned pieces of rope dipped in tar, in the hopes that it would attract the attention of passing ships. They were in a major shipping lane, and they could hope the passing ship would come to investigate their signal and rescue them. They eventually ran out of pieces of rope to burn, though, and they simply clung to the rigging, growing numb and stiff in the cold through the night. At six in the morning on October 31st, the lookout on the steamer the Humboldt, bound for New York from Brazil, was surprised to see two masts sticking straight out of the water about six miles from Bernagat. He alerted the officer on watch, who gave the order to go closer to investigate. 
Once they got closer, they could see that twelve men were clinging to the foremast of a ship. Boats were dispatched, but the men who were clinging to the mast were so stiff and cold that they had to be lifted into the boats. In total, the Humboldt rescued four officers and eight members of the crew of the Vizcaya. It was estimated that it took the rescued men two hours to warm up enough to properly tell the story of what had occurred. They sailed to the debris field in the hopes of finding anyone else, but they could not find anyone clinging to the wreckage, and they continued on their voyage, arriving at the bar of New York Harbor at 10.30, and announcing to the city the tragedy that had occurred only hours away. On board the Cornelius Hargrave, things had not been any less chaotic than on the Vizcaya. Paring saw one man who was later identified as the purser of the Vizcaya standing on the deck of the schooner with two bags of gold in his hands. The crew of the Cornelius Hargrave said that they had repeatedly told the purser to throw the metal overboard. It was too heavy, and save himself, but the purser refused and went down with the gold on the Cornelius Hargrave. The crew of the Cornelius Hargrave, meanwhile, had time to launch their boats, unlike the people of the Vizcaya. They were helped in this task by some of the crew of the Vizcaya, who had come down onto their deck. Captain Allen and seven members of the crew of the Cornelius Hargrave, including First Mate Perry, got into the ship's longboat. Joining them were also four members of the Vizcaya's crew. The ship's smaller boat was loaded with three other members of the Cornelius Hargrave's crew and one of the Vizcaya's men. As they left the ship, two more men from the Vizcaya leapt into the water to go after them, and the men in the small boat picked them up. In all of the confusion and in the darkness, they did not realize that they had left a man behind. Second Mate Walker had by far the most dramatic story out of the men of the Cornelius Hargrave. He said that he had been standing near Captain Allen when they had realized they were going to need to take to the boats, and that Captain Allen had immediately grabbed an axe and started to chop the boats free from their constraints. Walker said that he had been run down below decks to grab another axe, but the boats left without him. He described Captain Allen's boat as one that could hold 16 men, but it was only filled with five men, including Captain Allen, as it left him behind. He shouted out to Captain Allen to come back, but he said that Captain Allen simply waved at him, shouting something he could not hear, and then kept rowing away. Captain Allen had ten men under his command, and Walker was the only one who remained on the Cornelius Hargrave, but he alleged that there were others, not just himself, and the remaining part of the Vizcaya's crew who had not managed to find space on the boats. Walker and thirteen of the men from the Vizcaya found a plank to cling to in the water, but they were knocked off, and only eight managed to return to it again. Again, a wave hit them, and this time only six resurfaced. Slowly, people slipped away until Walker was all alone on the plank. Around four in the morning, he came to a raft, which had a member of the Vizcaya's crew on it, and he was invited onto the better means of flotation. Around six in the morning, the pilot boat, the Marshal, saw a man standing on a raft waving a coat with another man beside him. Walker and his companions were saved. The Marshal also found two more men on a raft, as well as two men who were clinging to an overturned boat, and a man who was clinging to a piece of wreckage. Not one of them had a life preserver on. But each occasion, the people they saved had found a piece of clothing or had ripped something from their clothing to use as a flag to attract attention. All of the men were so numb from the cold that the men on the marshal struggled to get them on board. The greatest concern was for the bosun, who was older than the others and in a weaker condition. One of the other men who was saved was an engine stoker who said that he had been in the engine room when the wreck occurred and the first he had known that the ship was in trouble was when he found himself in the water. The boats of the Cornelius Hargrave, with the majority of the crew on them, rowed initially towards the Bernagat Light in the hopes of attracting the attention of the life-saving crew, 
but they were not able to make a safe landing without assistance in the dark, so they instead headed toward the lights of two steamers. They also failed to attract the attention of the steamers, but around one in the morning, they were noticed and picked up by the schooner Sarah L. Davis, which then transferred them to the tugboat Hercules. When the tugboat heard of the accident, they headed to the wreck to see if anyone else could be saved, but there was no sign of anyone else above the water. This trip did mean that the people from the boats were the last to make landfall, and therefore the last to tell their story. When first mate Pering was shown Walker's account, he expressed his anger and disbelief. He told the papers that not only was there no way that Walker could have possibly seen the captain of the Vizcaya knocked down by their bowsprit at such a distance in the dark, but his allegations of cowardice against Captain Allen were entirely unfounded. Captain Allen had successfully saved all of the other members of his crew, which did not suggest that he had run away as fast as he could and abandoned his crew. He also had twice as many people on his boat than was alleged by Walker. In light of the allegations made by the crew of the Vizcaya that the reason why they had not avoided the Cornelius Hargrave was because the Cornelius Hargrave had not been showing any lights, all Pering could say was that, before the accident, he had heard Captain Allen ask Walker to make sure the Green Lantern was burning, and that Walker had gone to check and then returned saying it was. The masts of both ships stuck out in the middle of a very important shipping route and caused a lot of alarm. Some salvage work was done on a Vizcaya, and both ships were marked as a navigational hazard with lanterns and markers, as well as notices published in the paper warning mariners of the danger. On January 31st, 1891, the masts of both ships were destroyed by the U.S. Navy to allow 12 fathoms of clear water over the hulls for ships to safely travel. Both ships are now listed as places to scuba dive off the coast of New Jersey. The blame for the accident was never fully determined. The papers would say that it was clearly an accident that could have been prevented, except for criminal negligence, but whose negligence was a more complex issue and required information that was not available, or, at least, would never be disclosed. Did the third mate of the Vizcaya think that they could shoot across the schooner's bow? Did Captain Allen attempt the same to the Vizcaya? Were the sails on the Vizcaya fully set? and obstructing the view on the bridge. Were the lights on the Cornelius Hargrave burning? Did the Vizcaya fail to give right of way to the sailing ship, as was her right? Or did they never have a chance to see the other ship? The officers on the bridge of the Vizcaya were no longer able to answer any questions. And second mate Walker, whose watch it was on the Cornelius Hargrave, had had his honesty called into question. There really were no satisfactory answers, though both crews blamed each other. For more information, please see the Brooklyn Daily Eagle from November 2nd, 1890, or see our other sources in the description below. Thank you for listening. Thank you for visiting the Shipwreck Archives. See you soon.